So that means that neurons do produce and transcribe a lot of things that will then be packaged into vesicles. That probably makes sense. There's probably a lot of neurotransmitters and vesicles containing neurotransmitters. So you need to have something, um, if you want to be producing any kind of peptide, chances are it's going to be going into some sort of a vesicle. Or it will have to be embedded within a membrane, like for example, if you're trying to make some sort of a receptor on a cell surface. Again, it has to be embedded within a membrane, so it's going to be transcribed, uh, sorry, translated on an actual uh, replicant in particular. So um, neurons will have a lot of replicant just for this reason, just because they need to make proteins that are either embedded within that membrane or will be exported in some way. And by the way, um, in terms of neurotransmitters, most of them will not actually be complex peptides. Usually they're very small molecules, quite often just modified amino acids that become neuro, um, neurotransmitters. So, the cytoplasm processes are not only visible because, again, it's just cytoplasm and cell membrane. So most stains will not pick that up, unless the interior of that cytoplasmic process is going to be also filled with miscible substance. And that's one of the ways that we can actually tell the difference between dendrites and axons is that dendrites tend to have missile substance within them, whereas axons do not. Now, the neuron will generally have multiple, again, depending on the type of neuron we're looking at, I'm generalizing here. Uh, so the prototypical neuron that you will see in a textbook, uh, they always run the same way. Um, it's going to have multiple dendrites and just a single axon leaving the cell body. And generally, if you're seeing this in a textbook drawing, dendrites will be on the left of the page and the axon will be on the right. Because again, that's how it happens in the body, it's just the way it's always drawn. Now, there is going to be an axon which will transmit action potentials down to the terminus of that axon, the terminal epitome. And two other cells at the end of that terminus. Okay. Uh, the axon actually also will have transport going through it besides action potentials. So there will be vesicles traveling up and down the length of the axon. And so you can actually have transport towards the cell body from the terminus of the axon. And for example, rabies viruses tend to travel back to the central, the central nervous system using this transport. And then there's the anterograde transport, which goes from the cell body towards the termini. So, quick preview of what we're going to be seeing on your slides. Let me just turn down the lights a little bit more, so hopefully you can see this a little bit better. So what we have in the upper left hand corner is actually a cross section for the spinal cord. It doesn't look like much, I know. This will stay with the missile stain. So what we're really staying for is the missile substance. Or the DR. So the thing to notice, this is the boundary of the structure. What you can probably make out is that there is some sort of lightly staining material that I'm outlining right now. Okay. The stuff that I'm outlining right now is the gray matter. The gray matter is where you have the cell bodies of the neurons. It's called the gray matter because in anatomical sections it kind of looks gray. Whereas this stuff out here, around the outside of the spinal cord, is the white matter. And it's called the white matter because it looks like it's a white glistening substance. And that's because of the presence of lots and lots of myelin, or a lot of lipid, because myelin is lipid. And so all this over here is staying very poorly because there are no neuronal cell bodies out there. And all we're seeing is just the myelin sheets. And because again, this thing doesn't pick up with it, doesn't stain with it. It doesn't show up on the slide, so it's a very important cool state. Okay. If we were to take this region here and zoom in on it, you would see something that looks like this in the bottom right hand corner here. Now, 
before you go into this, if you look very closely, you might notice two things. Um, this kind of has a butterfly sort of shape to it, a gray substance, uh, the gray matter. And in this corner here, and this corner down here, at least, quote unquote wings, we have larger looking dots, okay? so larger cells. Whereas if you look at these ones up here, in these two regions, you can barely make any staining out because the cell bodies there, the neurons, are much more smaller. These regions right here and here are referred to as the dorsal horns or the posterior horns. So again, this region, this part of the gray matter, and this part of the gray matter is referred to as a dorsal horn or a posterior horn. And this is where we have the cell bodies of sensory neurons. They are small. They have relatively short processes because there will be input coming into them from other neurons in a peripheral nervous system. So just outside of the spinal cord, just outside of the spine, is going to be a ganglion or a large cluster of neuron cell bodies of some of your sensory cells or sensory neurons. And they will be transmitting information through using their processes into this region. And so these cells are small because they don't really require a lot of cytoplasm. They don't really require long processes, so their cell bodies are going to be small. This region right here and here is referred to as a ventral horn or the anterior horn. Now dorsal versus uh, posterior just basically depends on what type of animal you're looking at. If you're looking at an animal that walks on all fours, dorsal refers to the part that's facing up. So I think of dorsal fins on sharks, they'll help you remember that. Okay. So okay. If you're talking about someone that walks on two feet, like humans, that will be the posterior of the back. Okay. So the ventral horns or the anterior horns, the ones facing the interior or the front, this is where we see the large neuron cell bodies. And those are the motor neurons. These are the, motor, these are the neurons that basically like to do this. Okay. So basically the cell body in my spinal cord right now is telling me to do this, or telling my hand to do this. Okay. So that cell body right there is going to have an axon that sends that all the way down into my arm, all the way down to my fingers to make them wiggle. So you can imagine that's a pretty darn long process. It's a very long axon. I have fairly long arms, so you've got to figure about a meter from the point of uh, origin, okay? Uh, so, even though this is a fairly large cell body, relatively speaking, there's a lot of cytoplasm, a lot of plasma membrane that we do not see on this slide because it is part of a long process, an axon leading away from it. And because it has much longer processes to support, it's a very expensive cell, and it's a very large cell. Expensive in terms of it requires a lot of energy to maintain. Okay, let's still go down to this thing here now. So we've blown this picture up, the corner of this picture up to this. And what we see here is, well, basically seeing two neurons. This one here, and this one here. Okay. Based on what I just told you earlier, you know that these projections here, all three of them, are dendrites. How do you know this? The, uh, the processes are staying, so it means the processes are staying, they have missile substance within them. Okay. Whereas if we look at this neuron right here, we don't see the processes quite as well, but there is one going off in this direction. One of the things you'll notice is that there's a region right in the cell body, right close to this process, that actually looks much clearer. It doesn't seem to have that missile substance there. This is the axon hillock. Okay. It's a clear region of the cytoplasm just before you enter into the axon. Why doesn't this neuron have an axon? Or does it have an axon? 
Does this neuron have an axon? Yes or no? Yes. yes. 50 chance of getting it right. I'm going to say yes. Anybody say no? Why do you say yes? Because it's three dimensional, maybe it's not. There you go. It's three dimensional. You always have to remember when you're looking at these things. You're looking at three dimensional things, it's three dimensional. Just because you don't see the axon here doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It could be just below the thing of section or just above the thing of section. It could be poking out towards you. Okay? You don't know that. So just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So when you're looking for axon hillocks on your own slides, not every neuron is going to show you one. Okay? So this one in particular, a pretty good example. The other reason I like this one is that hey, we don't really see a nucleus here. Again, it depends on the plane of section you're looking for. Sometimes an initial substance will be right over the nucleus, and so you can't see the nucleus. Yeah, it's a three-dimensional structure. Whereas in this case here, you can very clearly see a very pale staining nucleus, lots of euchromatin, very clearly visible, and then a central nucleus right in the middle. Okay, so that's that owl's eye nucleus that I was describing for you earlier. Now you'll find that around the outside of the cell, you find a whole bunch of other cell bodies which are much, much smaller. And those belong to the supporting cells that we will be talking about a bit later on today. You can see that they are significantly smaller. I mean, the cell body of this cell here is about the same size as the nucleolus of this neuron. So we're looking at a significant difference in size. And again, that point is some idea that this is probably a motor neuron because it's a very large neuron. Okay, so speaking of neurons and what they look like. Um, there are a few categories that we have to find for how we would describe certain neurons. Uh, and different types of neurons from these categories will occur in different places in the body as well. So sometimes you will see predominantly multipolar neurons, and sometimes you will see bipolar neurons, or pseudo-unipolar or unipolar neurons. And let's just get into what that actually means. So what I've drawn on here is the beginnings of a multipolar neuron. It means it has multiple poles, i.e. multiple processes. Okay, so it will have multiple dendrites, and it will have one axon. Okay. So we can have, let's say, one axon leaving this. It can have multiple dendrites. Dr. Seuss fish, I guess. Okay. So that would be a multipolar neuron. Okay. So multiple dendrites. And one axon. I'm going to draw this axon properly. Axons actually have a constant diameter all the way through. that that region that's constantly being activated 
then you know decides, you know, this seems to be a message I get to get a lot. So maybe it's important. I'm going to listen to this more carefully. So I'm going to make more receptors in the surface of the membrane in this region to be able to listen for that signal. So it's more sensitive to that next time around when you do hear or you think of a long long about, let's say, the term long potentiation. That signal comes to much more easily and you remember it much more easily as well. The question back there? Okay. And again, the reason you do that is because you have roughly R very close to the target. So you can very quickly make whatever uh, receptors you need and target them specifically to the area where you need them. Okay. So that's why we have this with substance in the dendrites. We only really need that in the axons. Okay, so back to our uh, types of neurons. You can also have, and notice, my neuron also has dendrites on the axon on the right. It's the law. It's just the way it is. So let's go back to unipolar neurons. A unipolar neuron is a cell body and an axon. So a unipolar neuron doesn't really have any dendrites. What's going to happen with a unipolar neuron is that there will be other axons that terminate right against the surface of the cell body. So you're going to have other axons coming into contact with this. Axon 1, axon 2. And basically, other neurons simply make contact with the soma of this, of this neuron. And Basically, this neuron will simply transmit that information along the way. Okay, so it's a unipolar neuron. You can also have a bipolar neuron. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing is wrong with it. It has two poles. So it has an afferent fiber, a cell body. They're not too scale, by the way. I'm just drawing this one smaller because I want to make sure it fits on here. The reason I mention this is because these bipolar neurons can sometimes basically convert into or differentiate into a pseudo unipolar neuron, which a lot of your sensory neurons are like that. Where basically this afferent fiber and efferent fiber come very close together. So they essentially just have one fiber coming into the cell body and leaving the cell body. Okay. So this is a pseudo unipolar neuron. And so again, a lot of these things tend to be found within your peripheral nervous system as, as your sensory cells. So for example, uh, next week we'll be talking about some sensory structures. Sensory structures in your fingertips, for example. Okay. And so a sensory structure is going to, for example, you know, you put your finger against a pin. You're going to feel the sharpness of that pin. What's happening there is that there's a sensory structure that's going to be compressing this end right here, and that will start an action potential from the axon hillock. going down the length of this afferent fiber towards the cell body, and it will be transmitted down the efferent fiber towards the central nervous system, towards one of those sensory cells 
and your spinal cord in the dorsal horn. Now, because it has to travel a very long distance, you don't want to have depolarization, which is what tends to happen with regular dendrites. You don't want depolarization to be occurring because depolarization tends to attenuate over distance, okay, which means that you, know, you might have a dendrite activated in one region, uh, and there's a depolarization initially occurring in that region, but the further away you get from that region, the less and less depolarization there is. Okay, so it travels a little bit, but it doesn't travel very far. Whereas an action potential is the same strength all the way down the line. <coughs> Which is why if you want to send a really fast signal, you want to send an action potential and not just some depolarization down the length of the membrane. Okay. So there's a slight difference between the two types of biblical depolarizations in a way. Okay. So again, there's an axon hillock right there at the very beginning where you initially receive the signal, and then there's a very fast signal going to be sent down towards the cell body and towards your spinal cord. Now, but by the way, there's a whole bunch of people I know are taking their biology, so if I mess this up, do let me know. Do correct me if I'm messing up. I'm not a neurobiologist by training, so I'm just doing this from, first of all, memory, and secondly, from what I've learned reading stuff. So, uh, if you learn something new, new word on what I know, please let me know. Okay, so we have these types of neurons. Again, depending on where you are in the body, you will see different things. So what I'm going to do for the most part, though, is I'm going to talk about a typical multipolar neuron. And that's what most of the slides will tend to show you for the most part. OK, so back to the slide. Let's talk about the processes. So we've said a few things about the processes. We've got dendrites, which tend to be relatively short compared to the axon. And again, they tend to become depolarized. They don't carry action potentials. They carry depolarization. So we have our relatively short after processes. They can be variable in diameter, and even at a single process, will tend to be closer to the cell body, a little bit higher diameter, closer to its tip, much much uh, smaller diameter. So they tend to um, become more tapered the further away they get from the cell body. They will tend to display this whole substance where they roughly are, because again, they may need to translate a particular protein right at a particular site. Uh, they tend to be unmyelinated. So, because they are short, uh, you don't really need to have myelin sheath to speed up the transfer of the signal. Uh, and again, we're not sending an action potential down the line here, we're just sending depolarizations. It's a laser of depolarizations. Uh, and have something called the uretic spines. So, on their ends, going back to this diagram here, they tend to have these little bits of membrane that just sticking out of their surface, which seems to be just their surface area, first of all. But it actually does seem to have um, something to do with them able to actually pick up signals and process them properly. Uh, because it seems that uh, in studies of uh, children with um, uh, developmental problems with their central nervous systems, um, they have found that those children have longer vitreous spines than normal children. So there does seem to be some importance to these things. Okay. Now the axon uh, itself has, or begins at the axon hillock, which is known for three of any ribosomes or this whole substance. Uh, this is followed by something called the initial segment, which is where the action potential is going to be generated. So it's going to be, uh, basically the initial segment is kind of like the decision-making center of the neuron. This is where the neuron decides if it's going to send an action potential or not. How does the neuron decide this? It decides it by determining whether there's enough depolarization going down the whole cell to actually reach that um, and depolarize this region enough to cause an action potential to be fired off down the line. So we have to think of when you're thinking of um, neurons, and maybe this might help if we do a little quick visualization. So just put your hands away, close your eyes, and visualize a very calm pool of water, a nice cold water. This week, that's really, really nice thought. Okay. So nice, clear pool of water, 
narrow ripple, and of course, bright sky, not a cloud in the sky. So we're sitting in front of this pool of water, and you can think of this pool of water, the surface of that water, as the surface of your neuron. Okay. Now, let's say we have a small drop of water fall right down into the center of, center of the pool. What's going to happen? It'll be a ripple starting out. Initially, the ripple will be relatively large, but as we get further and further away from the center of the pool, the ripple will become smaller and smaller and basically attenuates. Does that ripple ever reach the edge of the pool? No. Okay. That's a depolarization. Okay. So that's not an action potential, it's a depolarization. Now you can think of a neuron as basically the cell that gets a lot of input. So a single neuron could have um, axons from, or uh, let's say axons from a thousand other neurons coming in. It's not always the case, but let's say we've got a thousand neurons sending out their axons towards this one neuron, and this one neuron is going to be making a decision. Now, let's say uh, 200 of those axons are screaming at this neuron saying, send an action potential, send an action potential. This is a very important, very, very important message. This needs to be sent, by the way, sent along. And there are, let's say, other 300 axons coming in from other neurons, basically saying, no, it's been not that important, nothing's going on. We don't need to send any action potentials. Uh, they might actually send inhibitory signals. Okay? So we can actually activate or depolarize the membrane at the dendrite, or you can hyperpolarize the membrane, which is more difficult for it to become depolarized. Okay? So basically, this one neuron is taking a lot of input in. How does it decide whether it wants to actually send off an action potential down the line? Well, it depends on how much the depolarization travels and how much of it is still present, how strong the depolarization is still by the time it reaches this initial segment. Okay? You can think of the initial segment as that edge of the pool. Okay? That edge of the pool has to be hit by a depolarization, has to be hit by a ripple strong enough for that initial segment to sense it and say, okay, this is important, I have to send it along. Okay. So, here it is, a, don't be afraid. It's okay, we'll go through this. Um, this is a very, very complicated looking diagram. Uh, I just pulled this up on Wikipedia um, because it is freely accessible. Somebody more talented than me spent a lot of time on the computer generating this, which I am very, very thankful for because this means that I didn't have to try to draw anything. So, what do we have here? We've got the cell body, or the pericarion. We've got the nucleus, the nucleolus. We've got some uh, rough ER, or missile substance. We've got some uh, mitochondria, etc. cetera, all kinds of different organelles, typical of any kind of cell. We've got these processes out here. These are the dendrites, and you can see they have small branches. Uh, and again, the more branches you have, the more input you can basically take in. And you can see that there are other processes coming in making synapses with our neuron. Okay? So again, these are processes coming in from an axon, and they will be telling this neuron, I want you to send a message along. This is a very important message I have. You need to send this along. It's very, very important. And there may be other ones coming in from another neuron saying, oh, this is not really that important. Nothing's going on. Don't worry about it. Just ignore that other message. Okay? So, here's the axon hillock, and the initial segment is going to be somewhere up here, right at the end of that axon hillock. Depending on which of these signals is going to be stronger, this will become depolarized or will not be, become, become depolarized. Now, let's think about that long-term differentiation that I mentioned earlier. Okay? Let's say that you're studying again, you're trying to remember what long-term differentiation means, and I'm not going to ask you about long-term differentiation in the example. That's, that's not a neurobiology course that we're dealing with here. In your neuro course, it's true, you may need to know that, or in your psychology, but in this course. So let's just say you're trying to memorize the name of all the different cell types, and so you're repeating them over and over and over again, and so that signal is coming through to this neuron down the same pathway every single time. At some point, this neuron is going to say, okay, there seems to be a signal coming in constantly. I should probably pay more attention to it. So again, the missile substance in this region, and in this region here, and this region, are going to start producing more receptors for whatever is being sent, whatever your transmitter is being sent through from this particular terminus. So that means that we have more receptors, we have 
bigger depolarization, the next time that this axon fires. Okay. More receptors means more depolarization, a bigger wave. That means that that wave is more likely to reach that initial segment, and that means that this initial segment is more likely to generate action potential that will be sent down the line, all the way down to this region right here. These are called telodendria. So basically the axon splits off into multiple endings. And again, it innervates another cell along the way. Probably telling your brain, you need to write down this word right here on this exam. And this is the answer. So, again, the more those surface receptors are present, the more likely it is you're going to have a larger uh, depolarization reaching this end here. Okay? If you have a very weak signal coming through, if you have very few connections with this particular neuron, and all the other neurons are saying, ah, just ignore it. Uh, let's just talk about battling about something. Don't worry about it. Uh, we never have to use this stuff ever again in our lives. Uh, then you probably won't remember this stuff, and this neuron won't fire on the exam, which will be a shame. Okay. So you want to make sure that your study so that the stuff that's coming through into your ears right now, or later on in your study, uh, is has more connections and or you have more receptors on the surface of these dendrites that can pick up a signal so they can send off a more clear signal towards that axon hillock in that initial segment. All right, so um, this right here is just a diagram of the synapse. So basically, you've got surface receptors right here. On the other side of that synapse, um, so this is the synaptic cleft, the space in the middle. That synaptic cleft will become filled with the neurotransmitter that is being released by this terminal muton over here. So you've got neurotransmitter vesicles that will fuse with the membrane when an action potential reaches this region. These vesicles will fuse with the membrane. And we'll talk about how for this shortly. Um, and the neurotransmitter will be released. It will interact with the surface receptors here. And because of this interaction, there will be voltage gated channels. That Really want to talk about that either, but there are channels that will allow for depolarization of this membrane here. Again, the more of these receptors you have, the more of those channels you have, the more depolarization you will have, and therefore a larger wave going down towards the axon hillock in the initial segment. Um, so, can you say repeat something that's going to be greater than the receptors, but if you stop repeating it, will the receptors degrade? So, over time, you may lose some receptors. Uh, but it depends on how long you do it for. So, I mean, short-term memory doesn't necessarily do this sort of thing. It doesn't really have that effect. But if we're talking about long-term memory, then chances are you're going to have this pathway primed for a very long time. Okay. So, we have repetition is in key in many cases. Yeah? So, can you go to the So, is it damage to the dendrites if they're suffering from memory loss? Um, that could be one of the things that happen. That's happening. Um, again, I'm not a neurobiologist, so let's ask the neurobiologist to know that. Okay. Have you been studying your memory loss for your final exam yet? No? Well, we get exactly the one. So they don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the answer to your question from me is I have no idea. There's a chance that it might have something to do with, um, yeah. with just. Uh, loss of connection between the dendrite and the axon. Uh, there might be some damage to the axon or to the dendrite, um, but I really can't speak to it because I can't really think to it. Okay. So I'm going to be making it very clear. Um, okay, so um, one of the other things that's on this diagram is this stuff over here. This is the myelin sheath. Uh, and basically, the myelin sheath is there to help speed up transmission of the action potential. If you didn't have the myelin on there, like I have on these neurons that are drawn, then the actual potential basically means that there's going to be a depolarization here. And so this depolarization will cause an influx of ions and change in membrane potential, uh, which is going to activate more channels right next to it, which is going to change the, actual, the membrane potential in this region. The change in memory potential in this region is going to cause the opening up of channels right next to it. And again, a change in memory potential. And so you have this very slow sort of transmission of the signal. Whereas if you have on 
higher than she thought. We basically have this kind of a electrical insulation. So this is my myelin. The myelin sheath is actually going to have gaps in it. Okay, so there will be gaps in between the individual segments. And so the same sort of channels that I just drew up here that would be activated next to one another will only occur in these regions here. This here is the node of Rangi. And so, if you have a myelin sheet, what's going to happen is uh, this region right here might depolarize and you might have a change in the number of potential. And then the ions will travel down to this region here and cause these channels to open up in the and so you have a depolarization occurring here at the node of Rangi, and then that depolarization will then jump to this node of Rangi, and then to the next one and the next one. Okay? So instead of having to depolarize every single channel along the way, uh, what happens is that only a few channels get depolarized a few, a few times at a time. Okay? So what you have is something called saltatory and so this allows for much faster transmission of signal because you're only really depolarizing things every few, uh, every certain bit of distance. Also, one of the other ways to speed up the transmission of the signal is to have a wider diameter as well. So the wider, the bigger the diameter of the axon, the faster the transmission will occur as well. Don't ask me why, I don't know physics behind it. Okay, so the myelin sheath protects and insulates the nerve fiber. Uh, the protection part of it we will tend to see a bit more of in next week's lecture we'll talk about the peripheral nervous system where the myelin sheath also kind of acts as this outer covering and barrier between the nervous tissue and the outside world. But it really helps us to speed up the transmission of signals and the actual potential down the line. <coughs> so that, and we know this because, for example, if we have some, if we know someone with a myelinating disease, we will notice that their movements are much less certain, much slower because it takes longer for the signals to travel back and forth so that their movements become a little less coordinated. Okay. So again, that's basically the loss of the myelin sheath that's causing this. It slows down the transmission of signal, and so if you're sensing things, the signal gets, takes longer to get back to your central nervous system, and then respond to that, and again, it takes longer to get back. Okay. So, the actual composition of myelin is mostly lipid, well, 70 to 80 percent is just basically membrane lipid. Now within those membrane lipids, we do have some protein embedded within the actual membrane, and those proteins will tend to help maintain the myelin. They will tend to help maintain the actual structure of the myelin. Okay? So there's something, for example, called myelin-basic protein, or MBP, which tends to hold the myelin together. And there are demyelinating diseases, uh, ones that is actually called immune disease, which attacks MBP, okay? and destroys MBP, and that causes a demyelination that just destroys the actual myelin sheath itself and again causes problems with motor coordination. So again, it's a cellular membrane, but it does have some protein within it, but mostly liquid. Which is why again, if we're trying to look at slides of myelin, we either see it as a clear space around the actual axon cylinder, or if we can manage to stain it with something like osmium tetroxide, we will see a black outline around the outside of our axons. Okay, so we need to be able to specifically stain the lipids in order to be able to visualize the myelin sheet. Now, depending on whether you look at the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, uh, there's different cell types that will be involved in producing it. And uh, the myelin sheet will have different characteristics depending on whether we're looking at peripheral or central nervous system. So then we'll be focusing more on the central nervous system so we'll just talk about myelin in terms of um, what happens there. But next week we'll compare it to 
what we see in the uh, central nervous system as well. So we'll look at peripheral versus central and look at the differences there. So in the central nervous system, it's called, it's generated by itself called an oligodendrocyte, or as in the peripheral nervous system, it's called by, uh, it's produced by itself called a Schwann cell, uh, which is probably what most of people, most people think of when they think of myelin sheath, they usually think of Schwann cells. This is what we usually are taught about. Uh, so those ones you can probably be able to understand a little bit more easily. Uh, all the other sites work a little bit differently than Ashwan itself. So we'll see better today. Uh, but these diagrams that we have here tend to be more, really more peripheral nervous system oriented. Uh, and so what you're seeing here are individual segments of myelin. Okay. And each one of these uh, is quite long in the peripheral nervous system. Myelin sheet uh, segments are quite long. And you can see a nucleus of the Schwann cell around the outside of this myelin cell. Okay. Now, not every axon is myelinated. Okay. Many of them are not myelinated. That does not mean that they are naked. Okay. It means that they simply don't have a very densely packed lipid membrane wrapped multiple times around the outside. So what we have on this slide here is, a, is an EM diagram or an EM photograph of two axons. So here's axon number one, here's axon number two. This one here has a myelin sheath around it. So what you see here is basically the cell body of a Schwann cell. And it has basically wrapped this membrane around the outside of this axon multiple times, which is why you see this very dark outline. Because basically every time you have a membrane, you see a black line under the electron microscope. Whereas the one down here, what you see is, a, again, an axon cylinder. Here's the nucleus of the Schwann cell. And then you have the cell body itself wrapping itself around the outside only once. Okay. This is uh, an unmyelinated axon. Again, it's not naked. It's not exposed to the outside. But it doesn't have that thick outer covering, that, that insulation that this one has. Okay. Again, this one is going to be able to send signals much faster. This one will probably be a little bit slower in sending the signal. Is that going to be a problem? Not necessarily. Okay. This one might have to carry that signal a very far distance and get that signal there very quickly. This one here might just be going over to the next neuron a couple of micrometers away. So if you're not sending a signal a long distance, there's not much point in investing a lot of energy in generating a myelin sheath for an axon. Because when you get there, 0.00001 milliseconds faster isn't really going to make that much of a difference, regardless of whether you're going to release or not. <clears throat> so, at this point, if you're a really short axon, you don't really need to have a lot of myelination. So, again, not all axons will be myelinated. But again, just because they're not myelinated does not mean that they are completely exposed. This is especially true in the peripheral nervous system, where you do have a lot of effort put into isolating your nervous system from everything else. All your axons from everything else are going to be isolated. And so again, when we see a lot of this unmyelinated and yet still covered type of thing going on. So here's just a diagram just to show you how this process occurs. Basically, you initially have a Schwann cell that just wraps itself once around an axon, kind of like what you see here. But then it just continues. So this membrane just invaginates in and starts wrapping itself around that axon multiple times. And as it's doing that, it's squeezing out the cytoplasm from in between the two membranes. So that's what we're seeing here, is that basically this leaf right here just kind of starts wrapping and rotating and rotating around. The interesting thing is that it is uh, cell surface molecules on the actual axon that will determine how many times this Schwann cell will wrap itself around. So the axon itself will control how thick that myelin sheet will be. And again, we have what we, what we see here is a very tightly wrapped lipid uh, sheet. Okay. So notice one thing there's a little bit of cytoplasm here around the inside of this myelin sheet. So in close contact with the axon, you have a little bit of periaxonal cytoplasm. Around the outside, 
of the model issue. You have the perinuclear cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. One of the functions of this cell out here is to provide metabolic support for the axon. How does it do that? Well, if you somehow need to be able to transfer things from out here into the cell and then into here. You can't do that if you have no connection there. You can't just burrow a hole in the, in the myelin sheath to get to the periaxonal cytoplasm. So there's got to be a different way of doing this. And there is a great diagram in your textbook, which unfortunately I don't have on here, um, that basically shows what I'm talking about. So before we get to this slide, let's do a drawing. Okay, and what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to attempt to flatten out and unroll a Schwann cell. Okay? So here's, here's what's going to happen. Let's say this is an axon. Okay? The Schwann cell wraps itself multiple times around the outside of the axon to make a thick outer cover with my own sheet. What I'm going to try to draw is what it looks like when you unwrap it so that there's a little bit of membrane attached here and the rest of the cell is just kind of hanging down. Okay? That's what I'm going to try to draw. So it, the reason I'm telling you this is that it's not going to look like and you're going to have a hard time figuring out what the heck I'm doing. Okay? So hopefully this helps. Okay? So let's say here's our axon. Okay? In fact, I'm going to draw it to Do the first one I'm going to do is going to be the one on the bottom. Okay. So here is the periaxonal cytoplasm. Again, I'm drawing this in two dimensions. You've got to remember this is three dimensional. So let's say this periaxonal cytoplasm goes around the back of the axon, so it's behind the drawing. It comes out on this side, so we'll use the rest of it over here. So you've got the periaxonal cytoplasm here as well. Kind of important, so don't sleep over those. Okay. Now, the rest of this out here is going to be just this flattened membrane. Okay. And then down here, I'm going to draw the rest of the cell. <coughs> Here's the cell body of the Schwann cell. Okay. So this is the perinuclear cytoplasm here. Now, this is the really unique part. There's going to be a little channel connecting the two. The rest of all this is just flat membrane against membrane. There's no cytoplasm anywhere here, just membrane. So the cytoplasm has actually been squeezed out of the process of making the myelin sheath. This space right here still cytoplasm. If we try to wrap this again around that axon, so let's pretend we're going to wrap this back around to make this. Can you do that? Hold it up. You're not missing much. We need to roll it back down again, so hopefully we'll know what we have. Okay. It's just the Schwann cell block. Okay. Alright, so if we were to try to, again, try to go back again and just wrap this around the outside of this axon, what would it look like? Well, you would start out with, initially, a little bit of that peri, uh, peri axonal cytoplasm. On either side. And again, I'm just kind of drawing this as a longitudinal section. So we're just cut this right down the middle of that axon longitudinally, so we're just seeing kind of a section through it. Okay? So, on this side here you have, again, just membrane, 
There will be a bit of a blip where that cytoplasm is. And again, more membrane against membrane. And again, a bit of a blip over here where the cytoplasm is. We can have a little bit of a port. And then again, membrane against membrane. And then again, a little bit of a blip. And membrane against membrane here. Again, bottom the same thing because it is three dimensional after all. Region that is not stained or doesn't have any myelin on it. So let's put down the next layer as we're wrapping this around. So the next layer again, we have a little bit of more membrane, again, a little bit of cytoplasm, and more membrane, more cytoplasm, more membrane, a little bit more of that cytoplasm, and again, membrane. Same thing down here, another layer of myelin. Wrapping this around back and forth. Okay. So we're just kind of going backwards. And then we have another layer down here. The reason we're doing this, by the way, is so I can explain to you what's on the next slide. Because otherwise, it's going to be kind of difficult to understand why you're seeing certain things. Okay. So there we go. A bit more cytoplasm. Any, basically, anytime I'm drawing one of these little blips, it's because that's where we would have a little bit of this showing through. Okay. There's a little tunnel of cytoplasm in between the membranes. Okay. So just keep on doing this, making it thicker and thicker to make a thicker myelin sheath. And always remember to just include that little bit of cytoplasm in the appropriate spot. So just keep on making it nice and thick. And so then we have the cytoplasm around the nucleus. Okay. So again, periaxonal cytoplasm, maybe I'll use a different marker. Just so it's clear. Periaxonal will be down here. And then again, perinuclear. So you'll notice that if we were to take a look at this section, we find these regions. You know, we need a different color to our one here, and here, and here, that are more poorly stained, that don't have that thick myelin there. Okay? It has some cytoplasm. These are called incisors. Or Clefts of <coughs> Schmidt Lanter, you know, the central nervous system or the nervous system in general is so complicated it tends to require two people to discover things. So we have something we have for two people. So two ways to call the either incisors of clefts of Schmidt Lantern. I tend to use both interchangeably, but you might prefer incisor because it's quicker and shorter, easier to memorize. Um, I'll accept either one. Okay? And what this allows is for transport to occur. So let's say you want to feed this axon, you've got stuff that this cell can absorb from the outside. It will then transport it through this long channel that winds its way around the outside all the way down into the periaxonal cytoplasm and can then be transported into the axon itself. Okay? So you have an easy way of allowing some metabolic support for that axon. Remember, axons are very long, so the perikaryon that's maybe in your uh, ventral form is not going to be able to support this part of the axon somewhere in this region of your arm. Okay? 
So you need to have another way of supporting that metabolically, and so that's going to be where the Schwann cells come in. And so they will have these clefts of schmidt or these incisures to allow for things to diffuse across from that uh, outside region of the cell, that perinuclear cytoplasm, all the way through into the perioxonal cytoplasm, and then be transported across to the mouse. So hopefully that makes some sort of sense. go into the picture. So what we're seeing in this picture are a few nerve fibers that have been teased apart. And so you can actually see individual nerve fibers. Now this is staying a little bit for the lipids. So wherever you're seeing darker regions, that's where you can see a bit more lipids. Okay? So if we look at one of these, for example this one, or this one, down the middle you have a slightly more pale region. That's because there's an axon in the middle. That axon has most of the cytoplasm, so it's not picking up a lot of stain. Whereas around the periphery, you see a bit more darker staining. That's the darker outline. That's your myelin. Okay. Now, in this particular one, if you follow this along, you will come to this region right here, where there's kind of an indentation, and then uh, comes back out. This indentation is a nodal bronchi. Now, if you notice, you can see there's a little line going across here. Um, if you look carefully, you can see this one's a little out of focus in this case, but you can see the lines a bit more clearly. There's one here, one here, one here. If you look at this nerve fiber over here, there's a line across here, here, and here. Again, these are not nodes of Ronde. Okay? These are the incisures of the plexus. Now, if you see these on a slide, you know you're looking at the peripheral nervous system. Because the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cell, is responsible for providing the metabolic support. And that's because these long, you can see very long segments of myelin are very long. In the central nervous system, these segments of myelin are much shorter, and metabolic support is going to be provided right at the neuron itself by a different cell. So, Remember, oligodendrocytes produce myelin in the central nervous system, but they're not the ones responsible for metabolic support. The metabolic support is going to be provided by cells called astrocytes. Here's another image, again, a um, bunch of nerve fibers together. And what you can see here is, again, a very intensely stained region. This is all myelin. And this, is the, this region right here, this indentation, is the nodal bronchi. Okay. Uh, there's another one visible over here. We'll see this slide again uh, next week when we're looking at the peripheral nervous system where I will talk a little bit about these fibers as well. Okay. The synapse. Uh, there are electrical synapses and chemical synapses. Uh, most of the time when we talk about synapses, we talk about what the chemical synapses. Again, I want you to think that this is the only type. You can actually have gap junctions attaching to neighboring cells. You can have the action potential just traveling right along through. Uh, but a lot of synapses are the chemical variety. Okay? So when we talk about a synapse, what we have is a presynaptic membrane, this is this region right here. A synaptic cleft, the space in between, and a postsynaptic membrane. A postsynaptic membrane could be a neuron, it could be a muscle fiber, it could be any kind of cell that is receiving innervation. And okay? that's going to be reacting to the release of a neurotransmitter. Okay? Now what happens at the chemical synapse is that you're going to have an action potential arriving here. That action potential is actually going to activate the opening of calcium channels in a terminal bouton. Okay. And by the way, this is called the terminal bouton. Um, which means but, it's French for but. Uh, so the central nervous system, there's a lot of French people involved. The rest of my class would be a lot of Germans. The French seem to like brains, I guess. Right? So it's a bouton. Um, basically, it just means butt. Okay? Uh, so at the terminal bouton, what you have is you're going to have an action potential coming in. It's going to open up some calcium channels. The influx of calcium into the cell. And again, anytime you have calcium entering the cell, it's going to do something. 
If the cells are very tightly controlled, calcium. Calcium ions tend to activate things. Okay. So once the calcium enters the cell, it's going to cause the fusion of these neurotransmitter vesicles with the presynaptic membrane and the release of neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter will then travel across this uh, synaptic cleft towards the surface receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Uh, you'll notice that there is a little bit of uh, material just underneath the membrane here, as well as the presynaptic membrane as well. This is the presynaptic density. There's just a lot of proteins uh, right at the surface there to help with the release of the neurotransmitters and with the docking of these uh, vesicles. And there's a postsynaptic density as well. Um, so again, we have calcium channels opening up, um, and those calcium channels will allow calcium to flow into the cell and cause the fusion of vesicles with the presynaptic membrane, the release of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters bind to the surface receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, opening up some voltage-gated channels and causing a depolarization down that membrane. Now, if we think about muscle, where is that going to go? Along that membrane. <coughs> wow, that was a while ago, wasn't it? You might have to know that again. Okay, so let's move on really quickly and talk about the central nervous system. And I really have an hour's not enough time, but we'll try to make two. So, this stuff we're going to see a few more slides. So, when we talk about the central nervous system, we mostly talk about the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so, we're going to be talking about the spinal cord today, as well as the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Okay, those are the parts of the brain that we'll be talking about. The neurobiology geeks in this room will not be happy with this because there's so many other parts that are interesting, but we're not going to talk. So, in terms of cell types, we're going to, we Talk about neurons. We're going to talk also about the supporting cell, the glial cells. Um, the neat thing about the glial cells is that they outnumber neurons. Uh, in fact, how many of you have seen um, the wedding crashers? So, mm -hmm. you. Uh, so you might remember the scene where Owen Wilson's character uh, is giving us line to this girl while we're dancing about, uh, you know how they say that we only use 10% of our brain. <laughs> Well, I think we only use 10% of our hearts. And of course, she falls for it, and um, you know, he has a great time. Um, but <laughs> anyway, where did that 10% number come from? Well, that 10% number is an actual real number. 10% uh, refers to the percentage of cells that are neurons in your central nervous system, in your brain. Now, uh, this is the danger of letting the media um, interpret scientific findings for you. The media took 10% of our brains are neurons, therefore we only use 10% of our brains. Very, very simple interpretation of scientific data. And what they have missed is that 90% of the cells in our brains are these guys right here, glial cells. Okay? These supporting cells. Okay? Just because 10% of our brains are neurons doesn't mean that we only use 10% of our brains. We use quite a bit more. Some of us could stand to use a little bit more, but for the most part, we're using a lot of our packs. Okay? So don't feel like you know we have a lot more than you can do. Although we have lots of potential, we all do. Okay? But it doesn't mean that you've got 90 percent more that you should be doing. Okay? Uh, 10 percent just refers to the number of neurons. Okay? So again, these guys, the glial cells, the supporting cells. Uh, make up roughly the other 90%. So they probably are important. Um, and we don't know too much about them. We know a few things. But most people have been focusing up until now on neurons because they're the interesting ones. They're the big ones. They're the ones that seem to do stuff. Well, we're finding out that all of these cells here also do stuff. That's kind of interesting. And some of them are actually involved in transmitting signals too. So really good stuff is that those of you who are in neurobiology, I'm sure you probably can help me out with this. I probably won't thank you. Okay, so oligodendrocytes would be the first one of the glial cells we'll be talking about. Um, and these are the supporting cells uh, for the neurons, specifically the axons. Okay? 
And so these are the cells that produce that myelin sheath that we just talked about. In the central nervous system, what you have is, let me just skip through some more things. So they're the ones that produce that myelin sheath in the central nervous system. Um, and they do it a little differently than each one cell. So the cell doesn't actually wrap itself around the neural fiber. It doesn't wrap itself around that axon. What it does instead is it sends out a cytoplasmic process, a small projection, and that projection wraps itself around the axon. As you might imagine, that will result in a much shorter segment, okay, or a much shorter internode. Okay, so that segment of mine is called an internode, lives in between two nodes of Ronnie. Okay. So you can have multiple cytoplasmic processes being produced by one of these oligodendrocytes, endocytes, and so some of those processes might wrap around a single axon. So you might have several segments on a single axon produced by a single oligodendrocyte. At the same time, that same little dendrocyte could send off a couple more processes off in a different direction and wrap them, so, and wrap them around a couple of different axons as well. So you could have a single oligodendrocyte in contact with multiple axons. And again, in that case, that oligodendrocyte is not going to be responsible for providing metabolic support. It's really going to be there mostly just to provide that electrical insulation. So that means that when we're talking about the myelin sheath in the central nervous system, we're probably not going to see much of that hairy axonal cytoplasm. It's not really necessary there. We're not going to see cytoplasm that is perinuclear per se in terms of just around the outside of that myelin sheath. The perinuclear cytoplasm will be with the body of that particular cell. Okay. So what do we look for? Well, we look for a cell that is highly basophilic. It tends to have a pretty oval nucleus. And if the slide is really, really well stained, you will cut out and see a somewhat clear or unstained space around that nucleus. So those are things to look for on a slide. Again, that nucleus is going to be very small relative to the cell, to the neuron cell that it will be next to. Next on the list, I'm just going to show you the next cell on the list is the astrocytes. And again, this is a cell that has received very little attention, um, but it seems to be involved in a lot of things. This is one of the main supporting cells of the central nervous system. Um, these cells tend to have relatively large cell bodies, so relatively large nucleal cells compared to the other glial cells, not compared to the, nu the neurons, but compared to other glial cells, they're fairly large. Um, they tend to support blood vessels. So you have cytoplasmic processes going off in different directions, and some of them will get attached to blood vessels, where they will be forming part of the blood-brain barrier. And the other side of a process might be in contact with a neuron cell body, or with one of the nodes of Ronde, where that cell will be providing metabolic support. If you think about this, astrocytes, again, here's a blood vessel. We're going to have an astrocyte sending off processes onto the surface of the blood vessel. So that might be coming off into the 
site and this one as well because we have a single with an address site making multiple connections. And here's our oval nucleus plugging a bit more dark stain than that of an astro site. is a blood vessel containing blood. Now, again, your central nervous system is the most important part of you. So it's going to be very, very well protected. It's going to be very much isolated from anything that could do harm, including any pathogens that would pass through your bloodstream. And so whatever's in your bloodstream, first of all, will have to pass through the endothelium. It's going to be a simple stainless endothelium, a continuous capillary. <coughs> So, no fenestra, continuous basement membrane. So, anything that passes across that endothelium has to pass across the cell. Because, again, those cells will have a very elaborate set of junctional complexes, the gonial occludents, to prevent things from passing across there. So, cells of the endothelium will control the passage across. And then, whatever they transport across will have to be allowed into the central the nervous system by the astrocyte. So the astrocyte is going to allow it to enter or not allow it to enter. The astrocyte is going to take it up and transport it to an axon or transport it to a neuron. Okay. So the astrocytes are the gatekeepers. They are separating everything else and they are tightly controlling what passes into the central nervous system and what is actually allowed to come near your neurons and axons. This region as well as the mode of Rangay. Rangay, French name. I'm not making fun of it, it's true. Okay. So, again, we've got an astrocyte in contact with a blood vessel making part of that blood brain barrier. And it will again be supporting, providing metabolic support for axons, providing metabolic support for neurons. Also, notice that it is attaching to all these things. So, it's kind of a structural unit as well. So, it will actually provide the framework on which everything else sits. Just imagine a whole bunch of these processes kind of spread out throughout the central nervous system. All the other processes have to pass through that. So, everything's kind of going to be sitting on top of all these processes. So one of the things that, that astrocytes can do is they will provide kind of physical support for everything in there. Uh, during central nervous system development, they will provide pathways through, through which axons will, will travel and grow, through which dendrites might go as well. So they will provide kind of a pathway for, for these things to actually develop. So they definitely help with development of the central nervous system. Um, they're also the ones that are going to be involved with this region here. Uh, chances are, if you've got a neurotransmitter being released into the cleft, if it was just an open space, it would have stuff diffusing out here and possibly attaching to other uh, receptors elsewhere that really weren't meant to be targeted. And so this region right here, the synapse, is actually going to be surrounded and completely uh, isolated by astrocytes as well. So astrocytes will be here around the outside, the processes will be around the outside to isolate that synapse so that this neurotransmitter stays where it's supposed to stay. And then, once it's done its job, astrocytes will be among the cells that actually will recycle that neurotransmitter. So they will take up that neurotransmitter so that it can be recycled and reused again. Okay. So that's another function of astrocytes. Okay. Um, by the way, these structures here are referred to as perivascular feet. on the slide. Um, they do have also some uh, control over the activity of cells called microglia. Microglia are the vacuum cleaners or the macrophages 
of the central nervous system. Right? So pain tissue needs to have some sort of a cell that palletizes things and cleans things up, and microglia are themselves, and their activity is going to be to some extent controlled by astrocytes. So astrocytes observe a lot of control over your central nervous system. They do a lot of things, really interesting cells. Another thing that they do is, if you imagine, okay, you've got a blood vessel here, so astrocytes provide a blood brain barrier, and that's one way of isolating things from the outside from the central nervous system. But your brain has a surface, right? So all the way out here, that needs to also be isolated. And again, astrocytes will send off their processes to produce something called the glia limitans. process only. So this will have a process also going to the surface of the brain. And you're going to have, again, a whole bunch of these from other astrocytes as well. Basically, we're producing this continuous network of these processes at the surface of the brain. And this is called the glia Anything else I need to add about astrocytes? Any other neurostudents? No? This is news to you, then you're going to say something about it. Okay. So, again, um, very, very important cells. And in this logic thing, we tend to be able to identify two types. There are protoplasmic astrocytes that kind of look like this, they kind of look, have a mossy appearance. And there are fibrous astrocytes, which have a more slender processes, long slender processes. Um, differences between them, well, protoplasmic astrocytes are going to be mostly found in the gray matter, whereas fibrous tend to be mostly within white matter. Again, it's not a hard and fast rule, there is some going to be here and there. But for the most part, if you're looking at astrocytes that within white matter, most of them will be fibrous astrocytes. If you're looking at gray matter, most of them will be protons and astrocytes. So, if you're looking at white matter, what kind of astrocytes are we expecting here? Fibrous. Um, which ones are fibrous astrocytes? That's a good question. What you're seeing here uh, is a slide that was specifically stated for glial cells. So basically, glial filaments are what's showing up on here, uh, which is why we can actually see cytoplasmic processes going up in different directions because it's the cytoskeleton of these cells that take state specifically. Okay. Again, we're in the white matter, so we're likely to see a lot of neuron cell bodies. And again, this thing was specific for glial filaments, so we've got a glial specific to begin with. So all of these are either astrocytes or they're all with endocytes. Which one's which? Okay. One of the things you can look for is can you identify a nice straight fiber that would like to be an axon? If they can find a really thin straight fiber that looks like it might be an axon, chances are the cells associated with it are going to be all with endocytes. They're the ones that provide that myelin sheath. So they're the most likely to be there. Okay. If you can see something that looks like a blood vessel, i.e. you can see branching and it's relatively wide, you're probably looking at astrocytes. Okay. That's the thing I can tell you. With this stain, you can't really see the nucleus, so the nuclear shape is not going to help you very much. Okay. Uh, am I going to show you this slide and ask you to identify a long with on the slide? No. Uh, we're not going to spend enough time looking at these slides for you to really feel like it's a fair question to ask. So, I'm not going to ask you a, a practical exam to identify all the dendrocytes or astrocytes on a slide like this. Okay? Uh, but you should still take a look at these and try to figure it out. Can you actually figure out which one is which? Microglia, okay. which these earlier, these are the vacuum cleaner of the central nervous system. These are part of the mononuclear phagocyte system. So, they would differentiate from monocytes, just like macrophages. Okay? So this is kind of like the equivalent of macrophage, but in the nervous tissue as opposed to the connective tissue. Okay. So this is a cell type that runs around, cleans up whatever doesn't belong. 
try to initiate inflammatory responses, which you probably don't want. Why do we want inflammation in the central nervous system? Why would that be a bad thing? Sorry? Because things can't get in anymore? Okay. That's the reason that it didn't in the first place. Alright, so, I mean, it's, your central nervous system is fairly well protected, but sometimes something does manage to get across the barrier. So, we don't want inflammation because. The confined space. The confined space. One of the things, first thing that, about inflammation that's going to happen is swelling. swelling. If you swell up, you want to compress all those precious neurons. If you put too much stress on them, they will die. Okay? So you want to try to avoid having inflammatory responses in the central nervous system. So again, these cells are going to be very tightly controlled. Okay? And again, one of the reasons that we have such a very uh, protective outer covering on our central nervous system, we have that glial limitans, we have the blood-brain barrier, is to help prevent anything like that from happening. Very tight control over what actually can access our central nervous system. Which is one of the reasons, for example, that if you're designing uh, drugs that would treat uh, central nervous system problems, if you're trying to, for example, uh, make an antipsychotic drug, you need to find a way to actually pass that blood brain barrier. A lot of the problems with actually designing these things is that even if you have a molecule that potentially do the job that you wanted to, you still have to be able to get into the central nervous system, usually through the bloodstream. Okay? So unless you're injecting it directly into the brain, I don't know. You're going to have a hard time getting it in if you don't design it properly. So it's got to be small enough to be allowed to access your central nervous system through the blood vessels and through that blood brain barrier. You know, so again, a lot of the trick to designing kind of pharmaceuticals in these cases is passing that blood brain barrier. So, um, again, they originated in the bone marrow because, again, they are part of the mononuclear phagocyte system, so they come from monocytes. Um, in terms of seeing them on slides, they're very difficult. First of all, they're not terribly common. Okay? In fact, I don't have any pictures of them to show you. Please do not ask your TA to find you one. They will spend hours in front of your microscope and won't be able to help anybody else. If you find one, great, tell everybody else, and then find a new microscope because everybody else will be looking first in this half an hour. Um, but basically what you're looking for is something with a relatively small elongated nucleus. It's a very small cell. Okay? It has some very short processes. So they're not going to be very long tendrils of cytoplasm. They're going to be relatively short kind of stubby processes that have those spines, small spikes on them. If you want to see examples, look in your textbook. Um, 5th edition, 1218, 6th edition, 1221. Okay, so those are what you will look at if you want to see an example of a microglia. There's like, I think, three cells side by side on that particular slide. Last but not least, epidymal cells. Um, these are found covering the surface of the interior surfaces, uh, the ventricles, the brain, and the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, so these are the cells that are responsible for production and recirculation of the cerebral spinal fluid. They kind of look like epithelial cells when you look at them on the slide. They kind of almost look like a simple pulmonary epithelium, except you have to remember this is nervous tissue, it's not epithelial. These cells do not have a basement membrane. Instead, they are in contact with, what kind of cell do you think? Asking questions, just getting some money on slides. So they're in contact with, surprise, surprise, astrocytes, which are going to be very carefully monitoring what's going on up here, what passes across those epidermal cells. Okay. Um, epidermal cells are very easy to identify on slide. If you look at some of the slides that we have shortly, you will see that's a very nice, neat layer of epithelial like cells. Okay. In fact, they have some surface specializations that tend to make them very similar to epithelial cells as well. They will then have cilia to help circulate the fluid. They will also have microvilli to help take some of it up. Okay. Now, um, I need to talk about this because I think we're going to talk about stuff like this. Okay. So, the meninges is the outer covering. So, once you get past the glial limitans on the outside of that, it's going to be mostly connective tissue. And that connective tissue is organized into layers. Um, and those layers together are referred to as the meninges. And they're 
uh, broken down into the germ matter, which is most closely associated with the actual skull, okay, or the actual bone protecting the central nervous system. Uh, the germ matter actually becomes continuous with the periosteum surrounding the bone. Okay. Uh, so it's a very dense connective kind of tissue. Uh, and then what we have is a very loose uh, meshwork, a very easily damaged meshwork of connective kind of tissue called the arachnoid layer. Uh, and this is easily separated from the PM matter, which is the next layer underneath that. When you prepare slides of the central nervous system, quite often the bone will be removed. And in the process of that, the germ matter will be associated with the bone and with that periosteum. And the first thing that's going to easily damage is that arachnoid layer because of just how fine it is and how, how loose it is. And so we usually lose that arachnoid layer as well. In many cases, all we get to see on our slides is the PM matter, which is a very thin, very delicate layer that contains some of the very small blood vessels before they branch off and enter into the central nervous system. And immediately, they're going to be surrounded by astrocytes. So this is the layer that's most likely to be present on the slide. This is what you're seeing here. So what we're seeing here is one of the skull side, the indentations in the spinal cord. At the edges here, what you can see is a little bit of white matter. Okay? And then all this material here, uh, this space here, by the way, is just an artifact of preparation. This is just is somewhat separate from the central nervous system because, again, that central nervous system is has that outer covering, the glial intents. So it's not very closely associated with it. But again, that space usually wouldn't be there um, in nature or in its normal state. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a bit of connective tissue, very loose connective tissue, some blood vessels passing through it. Uh, and again, those blood vessels are going to be closely associated with the blood vessels entering into that central nervous system to feed those cells there. Okay, so again, be prepared to see stuff like this on your slides when you're looking at them. So, really quickly, let's run through the different organs that we're going to talk about today. First of all, the spinal cord. The spinal cord is kind of difficult to try to picture in terms of two dimensions. So I wanted to put this picture up here because we'll be looking at this again next week. And so what we can see here is that outer protective material, the bone, the vertebrae, right down the middle what we have is the spinal cord passing through. And so this is the white matter on the outside. And you can see here's that butterfly-like shape of the gray matter. Right down the middle is the central canal, which is where you would find the epithelial cells on the surface of the neck. Okay. Again, if we're looking for neuron cell bodies, we would be looking for them in the gray matter. The white matter will contain the axons of the neurons, and they will also contain supporting cells, the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes, as well as the microglia as well. What I want to bring your attention to is also is this uh, bulge right here. These are the nerves. Uh, these ones are leaving the central nervous system. This is the ventral cord. This is where we have the, uh, the large motor neurons. And this is the dorsal cord. This is where you would have those sensory neurons, the small sensory neurons. This bulge up here is called the dorsal ganglion. And this bulge contains the cell bodies of some of those sensory neurons that are collecting information from things like your fingertips, for example. So there will be a sensory structure in your fingertip that would have an app or the afferent fiber starting out and going all the way down to the cell body down here. And then the efferent fiber would leave this and go into here and make contact with the sensory neuron. That sensory neuron will either then send off a message to your central nervous system or might directly make contact with the, uh, with the motor neuron. For example, if you have to have a really quick response to, for example, in, but you might be touching inadvertently, or if you're touching a hot surface, you want to pull your hand away. And so you have this kind of reflex action going on before your brain even processes the fact that you're touching something really hot, you pull your hand away and then you feel the pain afterwards. That's what's happening here. You're going to have uh, an axon coming in. Um, this cell is just going to transmit that information to a sensory neuron. That sensory neuron will quickly transmit that information to a motor neuron. The motor neuron sends off an action potential down towards your hand to pull it away. Um, and also the sensory neuron will send off an action potential down towards your brain or up towards your brain. Um, most of us stand up, right? Um, and again, then your brain process that and say, oh, that was really hot, better. Okay? Um, but not as badly as it could have hurt. Okay? 
that is the point. So uh, you can have one of these loops here happening as well. Okay? But again, this is the structure, one of the structures that we'll be talking about next week, the torsal loop ganglion. So I want you guys to see how close it is to the actual spinal cord. Okay. So uh, again, on the outside is the germ matter, right? and the PM matter. Again, that would be just around this region here, just underneath the bone, and you can involve any actual spinal cord itself, so where you can find the ridges. And then within the spinal cord, we have the white matter on the other side, gray matter on the inside, and then the central canal right in the middle there. Okay. Here it is, and I'm drawing cross section. Again, white matter around the outside, gray matter on the inside. Again, this is the anterior region, so this is the uh, ventral horn or anterior horn. That's the dorsal horn or the posterior horn. Right, so again, uh, motor neurons down here, sensory neurons up here and the central canal right there. If you want to look at the real thing, here it is. Okay. And so on the slide earlier, we were looking at just this region over here. So we were seeing that PM matter and these little two regions of the white matter. So here's the whole thing. So you have white matter on the outside, gray matter on the inside, and we have the central canal. You can see very clearly this very intensely stained layer of cells. Those are the epithelial cells. Okay. Uh, and if you look very close, and again, it's going to be very visible to you where you're sitting, but down here in this region, in that uh, ventral horn, there are some pretty large cell bodies clearly visible, even at this magnification. So you don't have to go to very high magnification for microscopes to see a lot of these structures. So I don't want you guys to go right directly to 40x or 100x. Stay at 4x or 10x uh, and take a look at low magnification uh, to see some of these structures because they will be quite obvious. Cerebellum. Uh, this is the simpler uh, structure that we'll be looking at today. Um, and here's where we're going to get into layers. Um, one of the things about these structures is they have to memorize a lot of layers. And there's nothing to do but memorize them. Okay. I will try to give you some tricks as to how to identify them, but you have to still memorize the order in which they come. <coughs> so, when we look at the cerebellum or any part of the brain, one of the things to notice is that on the outside, is when we have the gray matter. The white matter is now on the inside. So the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside, the gray matter is on the inside, and the brain, the gray matter is on the outside, and the white matter is on the inside now. Okay. So this right here is kind of one of those folds of the brain. It's called a gyrus. Just so I can spell it. Gyrus, one of these folds of the brain. This region right here is an adaptation, it's called a sulcus. Okay. So in the cerebellum, what you have is white matter on the inside. Because there's really not that much visible there. 
just looks like solid mass of material, but there's very few cells that can actually detect it. There are some small interneurons in there. Uh, and we're not going to go into the details of what they're called uh, for the purposes of this course. They're just very, very small neurons that will take a signal from the axon and transmit it to a different cell type. And this one's going to be called a Purkinje cell. Uh, we've heard Purkinje before, I told you, or I warned you, that we will be seeing that again. Purkinje cells, or Purkinje fibers. Purkinje cells are these flask-shaped cells. They are quite large compared to everything else around them. And they are arranged into a pretty nice neat layer, easily identifiable layer, at the boundary between the molecular layer and the granular layer. These are Purkinje cells. These Purkinje cells have a very elaborate dendritic tree, which I'm not going to draw off here because I have a drawing in your notes that does a much better job of it than I can possibly ever try. Okay. So, let's get away from the drawing. We have something similar in your notes. Okay. So we have these cells in here are the cells in the granular layer. It's labeled granule cells. Okay. Up here what we have is a nice sim single layer of Purkinje cells. And you can see this Purkinje cell has a very elaborate dendritic tree. That's because this cell is taking basically input from all of these cells in the granule layer. All these cells are setting their axons up here to make contact with the dendritic tree. And sometimes we have these interneurons that will we translate that information. But basically, you've got thousands of cells making contact with a single Purkinje cell. So imagine again, you've got thousands of cells screaming at this one cell, telling it to either send an actual potential or not send an actual potential. The Purkinje cell is the cell that makes decisions. Okay, so the Purkinje cell is a decision-making cell in a cerebellum. It's going to integrate thousands of inputs and then decide whether it wants to send an actual potential or not. How's that decision going to be made? Based on how much that depolarization do we have? Does that depolarization actually reach the axon pillock? Does it reach that initial segment enough, in enough strength to initiate that action potential? Now, Purkinje cells can be responsible for very automatic things, things that you don't really have to think about, things that you do without thinking about. And for example, you trip, your hands extend out in front of you. It's not always a good thing. Um, you can very easily break a lot of bones now. A friend of mine found that out when he fell off his bike. Um, and had to be in a cast for a very long time. But anyway, this is the automatic thing that you do. As soon as you trip, you go forward and your hands come out in front of you to break your fall and possibly your bones. So, again, that's what Purkinje cells do. They're responsible for these automatic responses. Okay? So if you don't think about it, you just do it. Uh, so again, and again, they're taking in a lot of input from a lot of different sources and deciding whether to act or not. And again, this drawing here was actually done by uh, one of the better known uh, neurobiologists called Ramon. I'd say it was Spanish, probably, so. but not just French. Sorry, it's spelled too weird. It's Kjl. It's not really pronounced Kjl. I don't speak Spanish, but I'm pretty sure that that's wrong. That's the spelling. C A J J A L. Okay. And one of the stains that we use in, in neurobiology is actually named after. Okay. And again, he studied uh, Purkinje cells. And again, the drawing that we saw on here was actually done by him. So he spent probably hours in front of a microscope, just drawing these cells of what we saw. Based on this thing that he developed to be able to do this. Okay, so we skipped over the slide here, and that's basically a slide of what we drew earlier. We have white matter just barely visible here as a separate layer. Then here is the granule cell layer. And then we can see individual cells up here. These are Purkinje cells. And all of this up here is the molecular layer. All this material that you're seeing in here, between the, between the salt side, is the PMF. So you can see 
some of the smaller blood vessels coming through uh, in this region. So again, some of them will be branching up and entering into the central nervous system to be immediately surrounded by astrocytes. Um, this is just oh, just through the cell sign and giant cell sign. Okay. And this right here is a picture of um, Rakinji cells that have actually been engineers to have green fluorescent protein attached to cytoskeleton. Okay. So wherever you're seeing green, that's where you have the cytoskeleton of a Rakinji cell. This is a great image because it actually shows you we have the cell body, and all this up here is the molecular layer. And that's you can actually see if you get a good enough image of this, just how fine some of those and how elaborate those little trees really are. And then down here, periodically, one of those little thin fibers passing through this region, that's the granule layer. And that basically contains the axons of these Purkinje fibers, sorry, Purkinje cells. I'll confuse it. So the Purkinje cell will send out an axon down through the molecular, through the granular layer, into the white matter that you're seeing here. So again, this is a whole bunch of these axons passing through the white matter. And again, on the other side, we've got the granule layer and the Purkinje cell layer. Okay, last point. Uh, I'm going to just make you guys memorize the layers. This is the cerebrum. Uh, much more complicated because it deals with much more complicated information. So the part of your body that is responsible for you thinking or daydreaming in class or memorizing things for exams um, and falling in love and all these wonderful things that your brain is responsible for. Well, obviously, it's going to be much more complicated than just three layers. Okay, it's a good one you have. So, learn to love your layers of the gray matter here. Uh, so, again, the gray matter is on the outside, white matter is on the inside. Uh, and this image doesn't really do it justice. So, we're going to switch over to this. This is the cerebrum. Obviously, very, very different from the cerebellum. So, do not ever confuse cerebrum with the cerebellum because I think it's quite clear that they are two very different looking structures, okay? histologically. Right down the middle, we have the white matter. So right here, we would have one of our gyri. So all of this here is gray matter. Down here is white matter. This is a sulcus. So we can see a little bit of pia matter and some of the blood vessels entering into the, um, into the gray matter here. Okay? So when we look at the layers of the gray matter, the outermost one again is the molecular layer. Very much like what we saw with the cerebellum, a very empty looking region. There's going to be some intermediate so, uh, neurons, some interneurons, um, but mostly it's just where we have a lot of axons and dendrites making contact. There's a lot of synapses there. The next layer underneath that is somewhere around here. Okay. And that's going to be the outer granular layer. Oh, just make sure that right is down. Outer granular layer. Where does it end? Who the heck knows? Okay, so here's the trick. Here's how you identify the layers. Once you've memorized them, from outside to inside, we've got molecular layer, outer granular, outer pyramidal, inner granular, inner pyramidal, then polymorphic, and then white matter. If you can remember the order, I will show you how to identify it. Okay. Here's the trick. Find the biggest set of neurons closest to the white matter first. Okay. So again, they're not going to be nice neat layers like they were with Purkinje cell layers, unfortunately. They are a mess. But find the first large neuron I can see. So there's one over here. Okay. Um, there's probably a couple over here as well. The one on this side is fairly clearly larger than everything else. Okay. So basically, right, roughly around this region, we will have our first layer of large neurons. Okay. The innermost layer of large neurons is the inner pyramidal layer. Anything between the inner pyramidal and the white matter is the polymorphic layer. The polymorphic layer is called polymorphic because the, new, the neurons there are of various shapes and sizes, okay. especially shapes. 
And if you look carefully at this region here, you will notice that, yeah, in fact, we don't see all of them being the same shape. They're all triangular. They all have different shapes to them. Okay? Whereas the rest of them tend to be mostly triangular or kind of um, diamond shaped looking cells. Okay? So this here will be the polymorphic layer. This region right here where we have some of these larger neurons. And again, it's not always very clear because it's not a nice neat layer anymore. It would be the inner pyramidal layer. This is the first and largest set of neurons in this region. The next thing you want to do is find the next largest cell. The next layer of large cells towards that molecular layer. And you'll notice there's one over here that's quite large. It's quite a distance away from this one. So these two are pretty large cells, far apart. And this is the inner parameter, this will be the outer parameter. Okay. So yeah, you can try to follow that along wherever you have some of these large neurons visible as well. Again, we don't see the whole layer of the green matter here on this side, so we're going to stick to this side here. So again, this is a large one, this is a large one, there's a couple more over here. Okay. So we've got some large neurons, some around this region here. Okay. So this will be our outer parameter layer. Everything between the outer parameter and the inner pyramidal is going to be inner granule. Anything between the outer pyramidal and the molecular layer is going to be outer granule. Check your legs. I'm pretty sure it's wrong. Okay. So that's how you like to find out. What do they do? You're going to have to take a neurobiology course to find that out. That's not how they work. So this is the cerebrum, a much, much, much more complex system because again, if you look at this diagram, they're all interconnected. They're all sending off processes in different directions. And again, there's going to be a lot of things that happen there. They really have no idea how exactly it works. Unless you're a neurobiologist, in which case, you probably just kind of do. Yeah? Good. So they can explain this. Alright, so we're going to stop here, pick it up next week with the uh, peripheral nervous system.